Chapter 5a and Alpha 1 of The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1 by George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5a and Alpha 1 Certainty and the Truth of Reason, Observation as a Mode of Reason, and the Observation of Things of Nature. Section C Free Concrete Mind. Translator's note. Reason is the first stage in the analysis of concrete mind, of universal self-consciousness of itself in its object and consciousness of the object as universal. Reason is not a mere function of mind, but a stage of mind. It therefore possesses its own peculiar content and operates in a process peculiar to itself. Its aim is to become completely conscious of its own nature, and to acquire this it must develop itself through its various phases. The process of development is from immediate to immediate, from what is implicitly to what is explicitly. The first step, therefore, is reason as immediate, where universal self is simply and directly aware of itself in a universal object. The operation of concrete mind at this stage is found where reason observes. The analysis of observation at this operates in the various domains covered by the empirical sciences. It is thus the subject matter of the following section. The processes of these various sciences are assumed in Hegel's analysis. Observation must change in character with the objects observed, hence the difference between the observation of inorganic and organic nature, observation of mind, and the relation of mind and nature. The difficulties reason has to face in this operation, and the contradiction into which it falls in seeking to find laws, etc., to satisfy its aim, form the substance of the following analysis. The nature of reason, as here conceived, is the source and origin of philosophical idealism. Whether the idealism be one-sided or absolute, idealism is, in fact, the philosophical expression of the principle of reason. Just the various empirical sciences may be said to be the development in the several ways in which experience dictates of the operation of rational observation. Hence the introductory pages of the following analysis are devoted to a statement of the character of true and false idealism. The historical material behind the abstract argument elaborated here is provided by the awakened scientific spirit that appeared after the Reformation and the methods and results of empirical sciences at the time Hegel wrote. In particular, the physiological conceptions of irritability, of sensibility and reproduction, discussed on page 256 and following, were first formulated by Haller, Elementia Physiologique, 1757-66, for a list of the chief scientific works which appeared shortly before or about the time of the following analysis was written, and which doubtless provided part of the material for the analysis, See Mertz, History of European Thought, Volume 1, pages 82 to 83. The polemical criticism which runs through this, as through almost every section of the work, is directed against one-sided idealism of Hegel's predecessors and the imperfect conception of scientific method displayed by the current science of nature. End of translator's note. With the thought that consciousness has laid hold of, that individual consciousness is inherently absolute reality, Consciousness turns back into itself. In the case of the unhappy consciousness, the inherent and essential reality is a beyond, remote from itself. But the process of its activity has in its case brought out the truth that individuality, when completely developed, individuality which is a concrete actual mode of consciousness, is made the negative of itself, i.e. the object extreme. In other words, has forced it to make explicit its self-existence, and turn this into an objective fact. In this process it has itself become aware too of its unity with the universal, a unity which, seeing that the individual, when sublated is the individual, is no longer looked on by us as falling outside it, and which, since consciousness maintains itself in this negative condition, is inherently in it as such its very essence. Its truth is what appears in the process of synthesis, where the extremes were seen to be absolutely held apart, 
as the middle term proclaiming to the unchangeable consciousness that the isolated individual has renounced itself and to the individual consciousness that the unchangeable consciousness is no longer for it an extreme but is one with it and reconciled to it this mediating term is the unity directly aware of both and relating to one another and the consciousness of their unity which it proclaims to consciousness thereby to itself it is the certainty of assurance of being all truth from the fact that self-consciousness is reason its hitherto negative attitude towards otherness turns round into a positive attitude so far it has been concerned merely with its independence and freedom it has sought to save and keep itself for itself as the expense of the word or its own actuality both of which appeared to it to evolve the denial of its own essential nature but qua reason assured of itself it is at peace so far as they are concerned and is able to endure them for it is certain itself is reality certain all concrete actuality is nothing else but it its thought is itself a ipso concrete reality its attitude towards the latter is thus that of idealism to it looking at itself in this way it seems as if now for the first time the world has come into being formerly it did not understand the world it desired the world and worked upon it then withdrew itself from it and retired into itself abolished the world so far as itself was concerned and abolished itself qua consciousness both the consciousness of that world as essentially real as well as the consciousness of its nothingness and unreality here for the first time after the grave of its truth is lost after the annihilation of its concrete actuality is itself done away with and the individuality of consciousness is seen to be in itself absolute reality it discovers the world as its own new and real world which in its permanence possesses an interest for it just as previously the interest lay only in its transitoriness the subsistence of the world is taken to mean the actual presence of its own truth it is certain of finding only itself there reason is the conscious certainty of being all reality this is how idealism announces its principle just as consciousness assuming the form of reason immediately and inherently contains that certainty within it in the same way idealism also directly proclaims and expresses that certainty i am i in the sense that the i which is object for me is soul and only object and is all reality and all that is present the i which is object to me here is not what we have in self-consciousness in general nor again what we have in free independent self-consciousness in the former it is merely empty object in general in the latter it is merely an object that withdraws itself from other objects that still hold their own alongside it in the present instance the object ego is object which is consciously known to exclude the existence of any other whatsoever self-consciousness however is not merely from its own point of view for sich but also in its very self and sich all reality primarily by the fact that it becomes this reality or rather demonstrates itself to be such it demonstrates itself to be this by the way in which otherness as inherently real and sich first disappears in the course of the dialectic movement of meaning meinen perceiving and understanding and afterwards in the movement through the independence of consciousness in lordship and servitude through the idea of freedom sceptical detachment and the struggle for absolute liberation on the part of the self-divided consciousness where otherness so far as being still for consciousness vanishes for the latter itself there appeared two aspects one after the other the one where the essential reality or the truly real present to consciousness had the characteristic of existence the other where it had the character of only being an object for consciousness but both led back to one single truth that what is or the real per se only is so far as it is an object for consciousness and that what is for consciousness is also inherently real the mode of consciousness which this truth constitutes has forgotten the process by which this result has been reached the pathway to it lies away behind this consciousness comes on the scene directly in the form of reason in other words this reason appearing thus immediately comes before us merely as the certainty of that truth it is merely assured of being all reality it does not however itself comprehend this fact 
for that forgotten pathway by which it arrives at this position is the process of comprehending what is involved in this mere assertion which it makes and on that account any one who has not taken this route finds the assertion unintelligible when he hears it expressed in this abstract form although as a matter of concrete experience he makes the same assertion himself this kind of idealism which does not trace the path to that result but starts off with the bare assertion of this truth is consequently a mere assurance which does not understand its own nature and cannot make itself intelligible to any one else it announces an intuitive certainty to which there stand in contrast other equally intuitive certainties that have been lost along that very pathway hence the claim and assurances made by these other certainties are equally entitled to a place alongside the assurance of that certainty reason takes its stand on the self-consciousness of each individual consciousness i am i my object and my essential reality is ego and no one will deny reason this truth but since it rests on this appeal it sanctions the truth of the other certainty viz there is for me another another qua ego is to me object and true reality or since i am object and reality to myself i am only so by withdrawing myself from the other altogether and appearing alongside it as an actuality only when reason comes forward as a reflection from the opposite certainty does its assertion in regarding itself appear in the form not merely of a certainty and an assurance but of a truth and a truth not alongside others but the only truth its appearing directly and immediately in the abstract form of its actual presence the essential nature and inherent reality of which is an absolute notion i e the process of its own development consciousness will determine its relation to otherness or its objects in various ways according as it is one or other stage of the development of the world spirit into self-consciousness how the world spirit immediately finds and determines itself and its object at any given time or how it appears to itself depends on what has come to be on what has come from or on what is already implicitly and inherently is reason is the certainty of being all reality this its inherent nature this reality is still however through and through a universal the pure abstraction of reality it is the first positive character which self-consciousness per se is aware of being an ego therefore merely the pure in a sense of existence in other words is the category bare and simple the category which usually has the significance of being the inmost essence of existence leaving existence quite undetermined or without determination by contrast to consciousness is here the essential nature or simple unity of existence merely in the sense of a reality that thinks to put it otherwise the category means this that existence and self-consciousness are the same being the same not as a matter of comparison but really and truly in and for themselves it is only a one-sided unsound idealism which lets this unity again appear on one side as consciousness with a reality per se over against it on the other but now this category or simple unity of self-consciousness and being has difference within it for its very nature consists in just this in being immediately one and identical with itself in otherness or in absolute difference difference therefore is but completely transparent a difference that is at the same time none it appears in the form of a plurality of categories since idealism declares the unity of self-consciousness to be all reality and at once takes it for the essential real without first having comprehended its absolutely negative nature only an absolutely negative reality contains within its very being negation determinateness or difference still more incomprehensible than the former is this viz that the category there are differences kinds or species of categories this assurance in general as also the assurance as any determinate number of kinds of categories is a new form of assurance which however itself implies that we are no longer to accept it as an assurance for since difference starts in the pure ego in pure understanding itself it is thereby f affirmed that here immediacy making assurances finding something given must be abandoned and reflective comprehension begin but to pick up the various categories again in any sort of a way as a kind of happy find hit upon e g 
in the different judgments and then to be content so to accept them must really be regarded as an outrage on scientific thinking translator's note this refers to kant's discovery of his table of categories and translator's note where is understanding to be able to demonstrate necessity if it is capable of doing so in its own case itself being of pure necessity now because in this way the pure essential being of things as well as their aspect of differences belongs to reason we can strictly speaking no longer talk of things at all i e something which would only be present to consciousness by negatively opposing it for the many categories are species of the pure category which means that the pure category is still their genus or essential nature and not opposed to them but they contain and imply the ambiguity of which otherness too in its aspect of plurality involves as against the pure category they in point of fact contradict the pure category by this plurality and the pure category must sublate themselves a process by which it constitutes itself as the negative unity of the different elements qua negative unity however it puts away from itself and excludes both the diverse elements as such and that previous immediate unity as such it is then individual singleness a new category which is an exclusive form of consciousness i e stands in relation to something else another this individuality in its transition from its notion to an external reality the pure schema which is at once consciousness and in consequence of it being a single individual an excluding unit points to the presence of an external other but the other of this category is merely the other categories first mentioned viz pure essential reality and pure difference and in this category i e just in affirming the other or in this other itself consciousness is likewise the other too each of these various moments points and refers to another at the same time however they do not involve any absolute otherness the pure category refers to the species which passes over into the negative category the category of exclusion individuality this latter however points back to them it is itself pure consciousness which is aware of each of them being always this clear unity with itself a unity however that in the same way is referred to another which in being disappears and in disappearing is once again brought into being we see pure consciousness here affirmed in a twofold form in one case it is the restless activity which passes hither and thither through all its moments seeing them in that otherness which is sublated in the process of grasping it in the other case it is the imperturbable unity certain of its own truth the restless activity constitutes the other for this unity while this unity for the other for that activity and with this reciprocally determining opposites consciousness and objects alternate consciousness thus at one time finds itself seeking about hither and thither and its object is absolutely what exists per se and is the essentially real at another time consciousness is aware of being the category bare and simple and the object is the movement of the different elements consciousness however qua essential reality is the whole of this process of passing out of itself qua simple category into individuality and the object of viewing this process in the object cancelling it as distinct appropriating it as its own and declaring itself as this certainty of being all reality of being both itself and its object its first declaration is merely this abstract empty phrase that everything is its own for the certainty of being all reality is to begin with the pure category reason knowing itself in this sense in its object is what finds expression in its abstract empty idealism it merely takes reason as reason appears at first and by its pointing out that in all being there is this bare consciousness of a mine and by expressing things as sensation or ideas it fancies it has shown that abstract mind of consciousness to be a complete reality it is bound therefore to be at the same time absolute empiricism because for the filling of this empty mind i e for the element of distinction and for all further development and embodiment of it its reason needs an impact and stos operating from without in which lies the fons et origio of the multiplicity of sensations or ideas this kind of idealism is thus just such a self-contradictory equivocation as scepticism only while the latter expresses itself negatively the former does so in a positive way 
but it fails just as completely as scepticism to link up its contradictory statements about pure consciousness being all reality while at the same time and the alien impact or sense impressions and ideas are equally reality it oscillates hither and thither from one to the other and tumbles into the false or sensuous infinite since all reality in the sense of the abstract mind and the other is an externality indifferent to it there is here affirmed just that sort of knowledge of an other on the part of reason which we met with before in the form of intending or meaning meinen perceiving and understanding which grasps what is meant and what is perceived such a kind of knowledge is at the same time asserted by the very principle of this idealism itself not to be the true knowledge for only the unity of apperception is the real truth of knowledge pure reason as conceived by this idealism if it is to get at this other which is essential to it i e really is per se but which it does not possess in itself it is thus thrown back on that knowledge which is not a knowledge of the real truth it thus condemns itself knowingly and voluntarily to being an untrue kind of knowledge and cannot get away from meaning and perceiving which for it have no truth at all it falls into a direct contradiction it asserts that the real has a twofold nature consists of elements of sheer opposition is unity of apperception and thing as well whether a thing is called an alien impact or an empirical entity or sensibility or the thing in itself it remains in principle precisely the same viz something external and foreign to that unity this idealism falls into such a contradiction because it asserts the abstract notion of reason to be the truth consequently reality comes directly before it just as much in a form which is not strictly the reality of reason at all whereas reason is all while intended to be reality reason remains in this case a restless search which in its very process of seeking declares that it is utterly impossible to have the satisfaction of finding but actual concrete reason is not so inconsequent as this being at first merely the certainty that it is all reality it is in this notion well aware that qua certainty qua ego it is not yet in truth all reality and thus reason is driven on to raise its formal certainty into actual truth and give concrete filling to the empty mine section a observation as a process of reason this consciousness which takes being to mean what is its own now seems indeed to adopt once again the attitude of meaning and perceiving but not in the sense that it is certain of what a mere other is but in the sense that it is certain of this other being itself formerly consciousness merely happened to perceive various elements in the thing and had a certain experience in so doing but here it settles itself to the observation to be made and the experience to be had meaning and perceiving which formerly were superseded in so far as we were concerned for uns are now superseded by consciousness on its own behalf for a's reason sets out to know the truth to find the form of a notion what for meaning and for perceiving is a thing i e it seeks in thinghood to have merely the consciousness of its own self reason has therefore here a universal interest in the world because it is the certainty of having the present within it or is certain that the actual present is rational it seeks its other while knowing that it there possesses nothing itself but itself it seeks merely its own infinitude while at first merely surmising that it is in the world of reality or knowing this only in general way to be its own domain it goes forward on this understanding and appropriates everywhere and at all points its own assured possession it plants the symbol of its sovereignty on the heights and the depths of reality but this superficial mine is not the final and supreme interest the joy of universal appropriation finds still in its property an otherness and externality which does not involve abstract reason reason has the presentiment of being a deeper reality than pure ego is and must demand that difference the manifold diversity of being should itself be its very own that the ego should look at and see itself as concrete reality and find itself present in objectively embodied form and in the shape of such a thing 
but if reason probes and gropes through the inmost recesses of the life of things and opens their every vein so that even reason itself may gush out of them then it will not achieve this desired result it must for its purpose have first brought about in itself its own completion in order to be able after that to experience what its completion means consciousness observes i e reason wants to find and to have itself in the form of existent object to be in concrete sensuously present form the consciousness thus observing fancies mient and indeed says that it wants to discover not itself but on the contrary the inner being of things qua things that this consciousness means this and says so lies in the fact that it is reason but it is reason as such but reason is such is for it not as yet object if it were to know reason to be equally and at once the essence of things and of itself and knew that reason can only be actually present in consciousness in the shape and embodiment peculiarly appropriate to reason then it would descend into the depths of its own being and seek reason there rather than in things if it had found reason there it would again turn from that and be directed upon concrete reality in order to see therein its own sensuous expression but would at the same time take that sensuous form to be essentially a notion translator's note this paragraph is a passing remark and refers to the method of the logic End translator's note reason as it immediately appears in the form of conscious certainty of being all reality takes its reality in the sense of immediacy of being and also takes the unity of ego with this objective existence in the sense of an immediate unity a unity which it reason has not yet separated and then again united the moments of being an ego or in other words a unity which reason has not yet come to understand it therefore when appearing as a conscious observation turns to things with the idea that it is really taking them as sensuous things opposed to the ego but its actual procedure contradicts this idea for it knows things it transforms their sensuous character into conceptions i e just into a kind of being which at the same time is ego it transforms thought into an existent thought or being into a thought constituted being and in fact asserts that things have truth merely as conceptions in this process it is only what the things are that consciousness in observation takes account of we however who are tracing the nature of this experience are interested in what conscious observation itself is the outcome of its process however will be that this consciousness becomes aware of being for itself what it is in itself i e to become aware of being to itself what in the meantime it is to us we have to consider the operation of this observational phase of reason in the varied moments of its activity it takes up this attitude towards nature mind and finally towards the relation of both in this form of sense existence and in all these it seeks to find itself as a definitely existing concrete actuality section alpha one observation of nature when this unreflective consciousness speaks of observation and experience as being the foundation of truth the phrase may possibly sound as if the whole business were a matter of tasting smelling feeling hearing and seeing it forgets in its zeal for tasting smelling etc to say that in point of fact it really and rationally determined for itself already the object thus sensually apprehended and this determination of the object is at least as important for it as that apprehension it will also as readily admit that its whole concerns is not simply a matter of perceiving and will not allow e g the perception that this penknife lies beside this snuff-box to pass for an observation what is perceived should at least have the significance of a universal and not of a sensuous particular this a universal here regarded is in the first instance merely self sameness its movement is merely the uniform recurrence of the same operation the consciousness which thus far finds in the object of merely universality or the abstract mine must take upon itself the movement particular to the object and since it is not yet at the stage of understanding that object it must at least be the recollection of it as a recollection which expresses in a universal way what in actual fact is merely given in the form of a particular this superficial method of getting out of particularity and this equally superficial type of universality into which the sense element is merely taken up 
without the sense element having itself become universal this description of things is not yet a process effected in the object itself the process really takes place solely in the function of describing the object as it is described has consequently lost interest while the one object is being described another must be kept in view and continually thought so as not to put a stop to the process of description if it is no longer easy to find new and whole things then there is nothing for it but to turn back upon those already found in order to divide them still further break them up into component parts and look out for any new aspects of thinghood that still remain in them there can be no stopping this restlessly active instinct in dealing with its material to find a new genus of distinctive significance or even to discover a new planet although an individual entity yet possesses the nature of a universal it can only fall to the lot of those who are lucky enough to do so but the boundary line of what like elephant oak gold is markedly distinctive the line of demarcation of what is genus and species passes through many stages into the endless particularization of the chaos of planets and animals kinds of rocks or metals forms of earth etc etc that only art and craft can bring to light in this realm where universality means indeterminateness where particularity now approximates to singleness and again at this point that even descends to it entirely there is offered an inexhaustible supply of material for observation and description to deal with here where a boundless field is opened up it can have found at the boundary line of the universal not an immeasurable wealth but instead merely the limitations of nature and of its own operation it can no longer know whether what seems to have been being per se is not the chance accident what bears the impress of a confused or unformed feeble image that it barely got it out of elementary indeterminateness cannot claim even to be described while the seeking and describing seem to be concerned merely with things that we see in point of fact it is not carried on at the level of sense perception rather what enables things to be known is more important for that process than the range of sense pr properties left over qualities of which of course the thing itself cannot do without but which consciousness dispenses with through this distinction into what is essential and what is unessential the notion rises out of the dispersion of sensibility and knowledge thereby makes it clear that it has to do with its own self at least quite as essentially as with the things this duality in the observed objects produces a certain hesitation as to whether what is essentially and necessary for knowledge is also in the case of things on the one hand the qualifying marks have merely to serve the purpose of knowledge in distinguishing things into say on the other hand however it is not the unessential qualities of things that have to be known but the feature in virtue of which they themselves break away from the general continuity of being as a whole get cut from the others and stand by themselves the distinguishing marks must not only have an essential relation to knowledge but also be the essential characteristic of things and the system of marks devised must conform to the system of nature itself and merely express this system this follows necessarily from the very principle and meaning of reason and the instinct of reason for it operates in observation merely as instinct has also in its systems attained this unity a unity where its objects are so constituted that they carry their own essential reality with them involve an existence on their own account and are not simply an incident of a given particular time or a particular place the distinguishing marks of animals for example are taken from their claws and teeth for in point of fact not only does knowledge distinguish thus one animal from another but each animal itself separates itself off thereby it preserves for its own sake by means of these weapons and keeps itself detached from the universal nature a plant on the other hand never gets the length of existing for its own sake it touches merely the boundary line of individuality this line is where plants show the semblance of diremption and separation by their position of different sex characteristics this furnishes therefore the principle for distinguishing plants into say what however stands on a still lower level cannot of itself any longer distinguish itself from another it gets lost when the contrast comes into play being per se and being in a relation come into conflict a thing in the latter case is something different from a thing in the former case whereas the individuum is what it is by preserving itself in relation to another what however is incapable of this and what becomes in chemical fashion something other than it is empirically confuses knowledge and gives rise to the same doubt as to whether knowledge is to hold on one side or the other since the thing 
has itself no self-consistency and these two sides fall apart within it in those systems where elements involve general self-sameness the character connotes at once what is self-same for knowledge and for things themselves as well but the expansion of these self-identical characteristics each of which describes undisturbed the entire circuit of its course and gets full scope to do as it likes necessarily leads re readily to its very opposite leads to the confusion of these characteristics for the qualifying mark of the general characteristic is the unity of opposite factors viz of what is determinate and what is per se universal it must therefore break asunder into this opposition if now on one side the characteristic overmasters the universality in which its essence lies on the other side again this universality equally keeps that characteristic under which control forces the latter on its boundary line and then mingles together its distinctions and essential constituents observation which kept them apart in an orderly fashion and thought it had hold of there something stable and fixed finds the principles overlapping and dominating one another sees confusions formed and transitions made from one to another here it finds united what is to look at first to be absolutely separated and there separated what it considered connected hence when observation thus holds by the unbroken self-sameness of being it has here just in the most general determinations given e g in the sense of its essential marks of an animal or planet to see itself tormented with instances which rob it of its very determination silence the universality it reached and reduce it again to unreflective observation and description observation which confines itself in this way to what is simple or restricts the sensuously dispersed elements by the universal thus finds its principle confused by its object because what is determined must by its very nature get lost in its opposite reason therefore must pass from that inert characteristic which had the semblance of stability and go on to observe it as really is in truth viz as relating to its opposite what are called essential marks are passive characteristics which when expressed and apprehended as simple do not bring out what constitutes their real nature which is to be vanishing moments of its process withdrawing and betaking itself into itself since the instinct of reason now arises at the point of looking for the characteristic in the light of its true nature that of essentially passing over it into its opposite and not existing apart by itself and for its own sake it seeks after the law and the notion of law it seeks for them moreover as an existing reality but this feature of concrete reality will in point of fact disappear before reason and the aspects of the law will become for it mere moments or abstractions so that the law comes to light in the nature of the notion which it has destroyed within itself the indifferent subsistence of sensuous reality to the consciousness observing the truth of law is given experience in the way that the sense existence is an object for consciousness the truth is not given in and for itself if however the law does not have its truth in the notion it is something contingent not a necessity in fact not a law its being essentially in the form of notion does not merely not contradict its being present for observation to deal with but really gives it on that account necessary existence and makes it an object for observation the universal in the sense of a rational universality is also universal in the sense implied in the above notion it is being for consciousness it presents itself there as the real the objective present the notion sets itself forth in the form of thinghood and sensuous existence but it does not on that account lose its nature and fall into the condition of immovable subsisting passivity or mere adventitious succession what is universally normal is also universally valid what ought to be as a matter of fact is too and what merely should be and is not has no real truth the instinct of reason is entirely within its rights when it stands firm on this point and refuses to be led astray by entia intellectus which merely ought to be and would have truth in the sense of this ought to be even though they are to be met with nowhere in experience and declined to be turned aside by the hypothetical suggestions and all the other impalpable unrealities designed in the interests of an everlasting ought to be which never is translator's note directed at kant and fichte for this reason 
it is just this certainty of having reality and what this consciousness is not aware of is an existent entity i e what does not appear is nothing for consciousness here at all the true nature of law viz that it is essentially reality will no doubt again assume for consciousness if it stops at the level of observation the form of an opposite over against the notion and the inherently universal in other words this consciousness does not take such an object as its law to be a reality of reason it thinks it has got there something external and foreign but it contradicts its own idea by actually and in fact not taking its universality to mean that all individual things of sense must have given evidence of the law to enable the truth of the law to be asserted to assert that stones when raised from the ground and let go fall does not require us to make the experiment with all stones it means that most likely this experiment must have been tried with a good many and from that we can by analogy draw an inference about the rest with the greatest probability or with perfect right yet analogy not only gives no perfect right but on account of its very nature contradicts itself so often that the inference to be drawn from analogy itself is rather that analogy is not at liberty to draw an inference probability which is what analogy would come to loses when face to face with truth every distinction of less and greater be the probability as great as it may be it is nothing as against truth the instinct of reason however takes as a matter of fact laws of that sort for truth it is when reason does not find necessity in them that it resorts to making this distinction and lowers the truth of the matter to the level of probability in order to bring out the imperfect way in which truth is presented to the consciousness that as yet has no insight into the pure notion for universality is before it there merely in the form of simple immediate universality but at the same time on account of this universality the law has truth for consciousness that a stone falls is true for consciousness because it is aware of the stone being heavy i e because in weight taken by itself as such the stone has that essential relation to the earth expressed in the act of falling consciousness thus finds in experience the objective being of the law but it has it there in the form of a notion as well and only because of both factors together is the law true for consciousness the law therefore is accepted as a law because it presents itself in the sphere of appearance and is at the same time in its very nature a notion the instinct of reason in this type of consciousness because the law is at the same time inherently a notion proceeds to give the law and its moments a purely conceptual form and proceeds to do this of necessity but without knowing that it is what it seeks to do it puts the law to the test of an experiment as the law first appears it is enveloped in particular sense and as the notion constituting its nature is involved with empirical elements the instinct of reason sets to work to find out by experimentation what follows in such and such circumstances by so doing the law seems only to be plunged still further into sense but sense existence really gets lost in the process the inner purport of this investigation is to find pure conditions of the law and this means nothing else even if the consciousness stating the fact were to think it meant something different than completely to bring out the law in conceptual shape and detach its moments entirely from determinate specific existence for example negative electricity which is known at first say in the form of resin electricity while positive electricity comes before us as glass electricity these by means of experiments lose altogether such a significance and become purely positive and negative electricity neither of which is bound up any longer with things of a particular kind and we can no longer say that these are bodies which are electrical positively others electrical negatively in the same way the relationship of acid and base and their reaction constitutes a law which these opposite factors appear as bodies yet these sundered things have no reality the power which tears them apart cannot prevent them entering at the same time into a process for they are merely this relation they cannot subsist and be indicated by themselves apart like a tooth or a claw that is their very nature is to pass over directly into neutral product to make their existence lie in being cancelled and superseded or make it into a universal and acid and base possess truth merely qua universal 
just then as glass and resin can be equally well positively and negatively electrified in the same way acid and base are not attached as properties or qualities to this or that reality each thing is only relatively acidulate and basic what seems to be an absolute base or an absolute acid gets in the so-called synomatis translator's note a term employed by chemist winterall at the beginning of the nineteenth century to denote combinations intermediate in character between physical mixtures and chemical combinations in synomates the bodies undergo in the product of change i e change of colour specific density and weight these changes do not take place in mere physical mixtures and yet they do not constitute a chemical combination examples of synomates are the blending of water and alcohol and the amalgam of minerals what seems to be an absolute acid or an absolute base gets the so-called synomates the opposite significance of the other the result of the experiments in this way is to cancel the moments or inner significations as properties of specific things and free the predicates from their subjects these predicates are found merely as universal and the truth that they are what they are because of this self-subsistence they therefore get the name kinds of matter which is neither a body nor a property of a body certainly no one would call acid positive and negative electricity heat etc bodies matter on the contrary is not a thing that exists it is being in the sense of universal being or being in the way that concept is being reason still instinctive correctly draws this distinction without being conscious that it reason by the very fact of its testing the law in every sense particular cancels the merely sensuous existence of the law and when it construes the moments of the law as forms of matter their essential nature is taken to be something universal and specifically expressed as a non-sensuous element of sense an incorporeal and yet objective existence we now have to see what turn its result takes and what new shape this activity of observation will in consequence assume the outcome and truth of this experimentation is found to be pure law freed from sensuous elements we find it as a concept which present in sense operates there independently and unrestrained while enveloped in sense is detached from it and is a concept bare and simple this which it is the truth the essential result now comes before this consciousness itself but as an object moreover since the object is not a result really for it and is unrelated to the preceding process the object is a peculiar kind of object and its relation to consciousness takes the form of another kind of observation such an object where the simple activity of the notion is the principle of the process within it is an organism end of chapter five a and alpha one Recording by Morris in Arlsey, Bedfordshire. Chapter number 5A Alpha 2 Part 1 of The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1 by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5A Alpha 2 Part 1 The Observation of Organic Nature organic existence is this absolutely fluid condition wherein the determinateness which alone would make it a definite entity for another is dissolved inorganic things involved determinateness in their very essence and on that account a thing realizes the completeness of the moments of the notion only along with another thing and hence gets lost when it enters the dialectic movement in the case of an organic being on the other hand all determinate characteristics by means of which it is palpable to another are held under the control of the simple organizing unity none of them come forward as essential and capable of detaching itself from the rest and relating itself to another organic being what is organic therefore preserves itself in its very relation the aspects of law on which the instinct of reason directs its observation here are as we see from above in the first instance organic nature and inorganic nature in their relation to one another the latter means for organic nature just the free play a freedom opposed to the formal principle of organic nature of those loosely floating characteristics in which the nature in its individual components is at once dissolved and out of the continuity of which the individuated elements of nature are at the same time resolved and exist separately air water earth zones climate are universal elements of this sort which make up the indeterminate simple being of natural individualities and in which 
these are at the same time reflected into themselves. Neither the individuality nor the natural element is absolutely self-contained. On the contrary, the independent detachment which observation finds these assuming towards one another, they stand at the same time in essential relation to one another, but in such a way that their independence and mutual indifference from the predominating feature, and only in part, become abstractions. Here, then, law applies as the relation of an element to the formative process of the organic being, which at one moment has the element over against itself, at another exhibits it within its own self-determining organic nature. But laws like these, animals belonging to the air, are of the nature of birds, those belonging to water have the constitution of fish, animals in northerly latitudes have thick coats of hair, and so on, such laws indicate a degree of poverty which does not do justice to the manifold variety of organic nature. Besides the fact that the free activity of organic nature can readily divest its forms of determinate characters like these, and everywhere presents of necessity exceptions to such laws or rules, as we might call them, the characterization of those very animals to which they do apply is so very superficial that even the necessity of the laws can be nothing else but superficial too, and does not carry us further than what is implied in speaking of the great influence of environment on the organism. And this does not tell us what properly falls under that influence, and what does not. Such like relations of organic beings to the elements they live in cannot therefore be strictly called laws at all, for on the one hand such a relation when we look at its content does not exhaust, as we saw, the range of the organic beings considered, and on the other the terms of the relation itself stand indifferently apart from one another and convey no necessity. In the concept of an acid lies the notion of a base, just as the notion of a positive electricity implies that of negative, but even though we do find that as a fact a thick coat of hair associated with an orderly latitude, the structure of a fish with water, or that with birds with air, there is nothing in the notion of the north implying the notion of a thick covering of hair, the notion of a structure of fish does not lie in the notion of the sea, nor does that of birds in the air. Because of this free detachment of the two notions from one another, there are, as a fact, also land animals with the essential characteristics of a bird, a fish, and so on. The necessity, just because it cannot be conceived to be an inner necessity of the object, ceases also to have a foothold in sense and can be no longer observed in actual reality, but has quitted the sphere of reality. Finding thus no place in the real object itself, it becomes what is called a teleological relation, a relation which is external to what is related, and consequently the very reverse of a law in its constitution. It is an idea entirely detached from the necessity of nature, a thought which leaves the necessity of nature behind and floats above it all by itself. Translator's note. Compare the above with the oscillation between the mechanical and teleological conception of law in theoretical biology. If the relationship above alluded to, of organic existence to the elemental conditions of nature does not express its true being, the notion of purpose, on the other hand, does contain it. The observing attitude does not indeed take the view to be the genuine essence of organic existence. This notion seems to it to fall outside the real nature of the organism and is then merely that external teleological relation above mentioned. Yet looking at how the organic being was previously characterized, the organic is, in point of fact, just really realized concrete purpose. For since itself maintains itself in relation to another, it is just that kind of natural existence in which natural reflects itself into in the notion, and the moments of necessity separated out by understanding, a cause and effect, and active and passive, are here brought together and combined into a single unity. In this way, we have here not only something appearing as a result of necessity, but because it has returned to itself, the last or the result is just as much the first which starts the process, and is to itself the purpose which it realises. What is organic does not produce something, it merely conserves itself, for what is produced is as much there already as produced. We must elucidate this principle more fully, both as it is in itself, and as it is for the instinct of reason, in order to see how reason finds itself there, but does not know itself in what it finds. The concept of purpose, then, which rational observation has reached, is, 
while reason has apprehended it in consciousness, given to reason as something actually real as well. It is not merely an external relation of the actual, but its inner being. This actual, which is itself a purpose, is related purposively to another, i.e. its relation is a contingent one with respect to what both are immediately. Prima facie, they are both self-subsistent and indifferent to one another. The real nature of their relation, however, is something different to what they thus appear to be, and its effect has another meaning than sense perception directly finds. The necessity inherent in the process is concealed and comes out at the end, but in such a way that this very end shows it to have been also the first. The end, however, shows this priority of itself by the fact that nothing comes out of the alternation of the act produced, but what was there already. Or again, if we start from what is first, this in coming in the end, or in the result of its act, merely returns to itself, and just by doing so it demonstrates itself to be that which has itself at its end. That is to say, qua first, it has already returned to itself, or is self-contained. It is in and for itself. What then it arrives at by the process of its action is itself, and its arriving merely at itself means feeling itself, it is self-feeling. Thus we have here, no doubt, the distinction between what it is and what it seeks but this is merely the semblance of a distinction and consequently is a notion in its very nature. This is exactly, however, the way self-consciousness is constituted. It distinguishes itself in the same manner from itself without any distinction being thereby established. Hence it is that it finds in the observation of organic nature nothing else than this kind of reality. It finds itself in the form of a thing, as a life, and yet between what it is in itself and what it has found draws a distinction which is, however, no distinction. Just as the instinct of an animal is to seek and consume food, but it does not thereby get beyond itself, similarly the instinct of reason in its seeking merely finds reason itself. An animal ends with self-feeling. The instinct of reason, on the other hand, is at the same time self-consciousness. But because it is merely instinct, it is put on one side, as against consciousness, and in the latter finds its opposite. Its satisfaction is, therefore, broken in two by this opposite. It finds itself, viz., the purpose, and also finds the purpose in the shape of the thing. But the purpose is seen to lie, in the first instance, apart from the thing, presenting itself as a purpose. In the second place, this purpose, qua purpose, is at the same time objective. It is taken to fall, therefore, not within the observing consciousness, but within another intelligence. Looked at more closely, there lies in the notion of the thing this character as well, that of being in itself a purpose. It preserves itself. This at once means it is its nature to conceal the necessity controlling it, and present that necessity in the form of a contingent relation. For its freedom, its being on its own account, means just that it behaves towards its necessary condition as something indifferent. It thus sets itself out to be something whose notion falls apart from its existence. In the same way, reason is compelled, by letting its own proper notion fall outside it, to look at itself as a thing, and that towards which it is indifferent, and which, in consequence, is reciprocally indifferent towards it, reason, and towards its own notion. Qua instinct, it continues to remain within this state of being, this condition of indifference, and the thing expressing the notion remains for it something other than this notion, and the notion other than the thing. Thus for reason, the thing organised is only a purpose per se, in the sense that the necessity which lies concealed within the action of the thing, for the active agency there takes up the attitude of being indifferent and isolated, falls outside the organism itself. Since, however, the organic qua purpose per se cannot behave in any other way than as organic, the fact of its being per se a purpose is also apparent and sensibly present, and as ob such observed. What is organic shows itself when observed to be something self-preserving, returning and returned to itself. 
but in this state of being observation does not recognize the concept of purpose and does not know the notion of purpose is not an intelligence anywhere else but just exists here and in the form of a thing observation makes a distinction between the concept of purpose and self-existence and self-preservation which is not a distinction at all that it is no distinction is something of which it was not aware what it is aware of is an act which appears contingent and indifferent towards what is brought about by that act and towards the unity which is all the while the principle connecting both that act and this purpose are taken to fall asunder on this view the special function of the organic is to be the inner operating activity lying in between its first and last purpose so far as this action implies the character of singleness so far however as the action has the character of universality and the active agent is equated with what is the outcome of its operation this purposive action as such would not seem to belong to the function of organic beings that individual action which is merely a means comes owing to the individual form to be determined by an entirely individual or contingent necessity what an organic being does for the preservation of itself as an individual or of itself qua genus is therefore quite lawless as regards this immediate content for notion and universal fall outside it its action would accordingly be empty agency without any content in it it would not even be the efficiency of a machine for this has a purpose and its activity in consequence a definite content if it were deserted in this way by the universal it would be an activity of a mere being qua being i e it would be an activity not forthwith reflected unto itself like that of an acid or a base one which could not be cut off from its immediate existence nor give up this existence that gets lost when related to its opposite but would be able to preserve itself this kind of being whose activity is here under consideration is however set down as a thing preserving itself in its relation to its opposite the activity as such is nothing but the bare insubstantial form of its independent existence on its own account and the purpose of the activity its substance a substance which is not simply a determinate being but the universal does not fall outside the activity it is an activity reverting into itself by its own nature and is not turned back into itself by any alien external agency the notion of universality and activity however is not a matter for this attitude of observation because that unity is essentially the inner movement of what is organic and can only be apprehended conceptually observation however seeks the moments in the form of existence and duration and because the organic whole consists essentially in not containing these moments in that form and in not letting them be found within that way this observing consciousness by its way of looking at the matter transforms the opposition into one which conforms and is adapted to its own point of view an organism comes before the observing consciousness in this manner as a way of relating two fixed and existing moments as a relation of elements in an opposition whose two factors seem in one respect really given to in observation while another respect as regards their content they express the opposition of the organic conception of purpose and actual reality but because the notion as such is there effaced this takes place in an obscure and superficial way where thought sinks to the level of mere ideal presentation thus we see the notion taken much in the sense of what is inner reality in the sense of what is outer and their relation gives rise to the law that the outer is the expression of the inner let us consider more closely this inner with its opposite and their relation to one another in the first place we find the two factors of the law no longer have such an import as we found in the case of previous laws where the elements appeared as independent things each being a particular body nor again in the second place do we find the universal is to have an existence somewhere else outside what actually is on the contrary the organic being is in its undivided oneness and as a whole the fundamental fact in the content of the inner and outer it is the same for both the opposition is on that account of a purely formal character its real sides have the same ultimate principle inherently constituting them what they are at the same time however since inner and outer are also opposite realities and each is a distinct being for observation they each seem 
to observation to have a peculiar content of their own. This peculiar content, since it consists of the same substance or the same organic unity, can however in point of fact be only a different form of that unity, of that substance. And this is indicated by observation when it says the outer is merely the expression of the inner. We have seen in the case of the concept of purpose the same characteristic features of this relation, viz. the indifferent independence of the diverse factors and their unity in that independence, a unity in which they disappear. We have now to see what shape and embodiment inner and outer assume in actually existing. The inner as such must have an outer being and an embodiment just as much as the outer as such, for the inner is an object, or is affirmed as being, and there is observation to deal with. The organic substance, qua inner, is the soul, simply the pure notion of purpose, or the universal, which is dividing it into discrete elements, remain all the same, a universal fluent continuity, and hence in its being appears as action or the moment of vanishing reality, while on the other hand, the outer, opposed to that existing inner, subsists in the passive being of the organic, the law as the relation of that inner to this outer consequently expresses its content now by setting forth universal moments or simple essential elements and again by setting forth the realized essential nature or the form and shape actually assumed those first simple organic properties to call them so are sensibility irritability and reproduction these properties at least the two first seem indeed to refer not to the organism in general but merely to the animal organism the vegetable level of organic life too expresses in point of fact only the bare and simple notion of organism which does not develop and evolve its moments hence in regard to those moments so far as observation has to take account of them we must confine ourselves to the organism which presents them existing in developed form as to these moments then they are directly derived from the notion of self-purpose of a being whose end is its own self for sensibility expresses in general the simple notion of organic reflection into itself or the universal continuity of this notion irritability again expresses organic elasticity the capacity to exercise the function of reacting simultaneously with self-reflection and expresses in contrast to the previous state of being passively and inertly within itself the condition of being explicitly actualized a realization where that abstract existence for its own sake comes to be an existence for something else reproduction however is the operation of this entire self-reflected organism its activity as having its purpose in itself its activity qua genus wherein the individual repels itself from itself where it repeats by procreation either the organic parts or the whole individual reproduction taken in the sense of self-preservation in general expresses the formal principle or conception of the organic or the fact of sensibility but it is properly speaking the realized notion of organic existence or the whole which either qua individual returns into itself through the process of producing individual parts of itself or qua genus does so through the production of distinct individuals the other significance of these organic elements viz as outer is their embodiment in a given shape here they assume the form of actual but at the same time universal parts or appear as organic systems sensibility is embodied in the form for instance of a nervous system irritability of a muscular system reproduction of an intestinal system for the preservation of the individual and the species laws peculiar to organic life accordingly concern a relation of the organic moments taking account of their twofold significance viz of being in one respect a part of the definite organic formation or embodiment and in another respect a continuous universal element of a determinate kind running through all these systems thus in giving expression to a law of that sort a specific kind of sensibility e g would find qua moment of the whole organism its expression in a determinately formed nervous system or it would also be connected with a determinate reproduction of the organic parts of the individual or with the propagation of the whole and so on both aspects of such a law can be observed the external is in its very conception being for another sensibility for example it finds immediately realized form in the sensitive system and qua universal property it is in its outer expressions an objective fact as well 
the aspect which is called inner has its own outer aspect which is distinct from what is in general called the outer both the aspects of an organic law would thus certainly be open to observation but not the laws of their relation and observation does not manage to do that not because qua observation it would be too short-sighted and should not proceed empirically but should start from the idea for such laws if they were something real must as a matter of fact be actual and must thus be observable it is rather because the thoughts of laws of this sort prove to have no truth at all it was put forward as a law that the universal organic property had formed itself in an organic system into a thing and there found its own embodied image and copy so that both were the same reality present in the one case as a universal moment in the other as a thing but besides the inner aspect is also for itself a relation of several aspects and hence to begin with the idea of a law is presented as the thought of a relation of universal organic activities or properties to one another whether such a law is possible it has to be decided from the nature of the property in question such a property however being universal and of a fluid nature is on the one hand not something restricted like a thing keeping itself within the distinction of a definite mode of existence which is to constitute its shape and form sensibility goes beyond the nervous system and pervades all the other systems of the organism on the other hand such a property is a universal moment which is essentially undivided and inseparable from reactions or irritability and reproduction for being reflection into itself it eo ipso already implies reaction merely to be reflected into itself is to be a passive or lifeless being and not sensibility just as action which is the same as reaction when not reflected into itself is not irritability reflection in action or reaction and action or reaction in reflection is just that whose unity constitutes the organic being a unity which is synonymous with organic reproduction it follows from this that in every form of reality there must be present the same quantity of sensibility since we are considering in the first instance the relation of sensibility and irritability to one another as of irritability and that organic phenomenon can be apprehended and determined or if we like explained just as much in terms of the one as of the other what one man takes for high sensibility another may just as rightly consider high irritability and an irritability of the same degree if they are called factors and this is not to be a meaningless phrase it is thereby expressly stated that they are moments of the notion in other words the real object the essential nature of which the notion constitutes contains them both alike within it and if the object is in one way characterized as very sensitive it can also be spoken of in the other way as likewise irritable if they are distinguished as they must be they are so in principle and their opposition is qualitative but when besides this true distinction they are also set down as extant and presented as different as they would be if they were aspects of the law they would appear quantitatively different their peculiar qualitative opposition thus passes into quantity and hence arise laws of this sort e.g. that sensibility and irritability stand in inverse quantitative relations so that when the one increases the other diminishes or better taking directly the quantity itself as the content that the magnitude of something increases as its smallness diminishes should a more specific content be given to this law however by saying for example that the size of a hole increases the more we decrease what it is filled with then this inverse relation might just as well be changed into a direct relation and expressed in the form that the quantity of the whole increases in direct ratio to the amount of things we take away a tautological proposition whether expressed as a direct or an inverse relation so expressed it comes merely to this that a quantity increases as this quantity increases the whole and what fills it and is removed from it are qualitatively opposed but the real content there and its specific quantity are both one and the same and similarly the increase of quantity and decrease of smallness are the same and their meaningless opposition runs into a tautology in like manner the organic moments are equally inseparable in their real content and in their quantity which is the quantity of that reality the one decreases only with the other and only decreases with it for one has literally a significance only in as far as the other is present 
or rather it is a matter of indifference whether an organic phenomenon is considered as an irritability or as a sensibility this is so in general and likewise when its quantity is in question just as it is indifferent whether we speak of the increase of a whole as an increase in the whole qua emptiness or in the increase of a filling removed from it or again a number say three is equally great whether i take it positively or negatively and if i increase it the three to four the positive as well as the negative becomes four just as the south pole in the case of a magnet is precisely as strong as its north pole or a positive electricity or an acid is exactly as strong as its negative or the base on which it operates an organic existence is also such a magnitude or quantity like the number three or the magnet etc it is that which is increased or diminished and if it is increased then both its factors are increased as much as both poles of the magnet or both kinds of electricity increase if the potential law of a magnet or if one of the electric currents is raised that both are just as little different in intention and extension that the one cannot decrease in extension and increase in intention while the other conversely has to diminish in its intention and increase in its extension this comes from the same notion of an unreal and empty opposition the real intention is absolutely as great as the extension and vice versa what really happens in the framing of a law of this kind is obviously that at the outset irritability and sensibility are taken to constitute the specifically determinate organic opposition this content however is lost sight of and the opposition goes off in a formal opposition of quantitative increase and diminution or of different intention and extension an opposition which has no longer anything to do with the nature of sensibility and irritability and no longer expresses it hence this mere playing at law-making is not confined to organic moments but can be carried on everywhere with everything and rests in general on want of acquaintance with the logical nature of these oppositions lastly if instead of sensibility and irritability reproduction is brought into relation with one another of them then here too we fail to find any occasion for framing laws of this kind for reproduction does not stand in any opposition to these moments and they are not opposed to one another and since the making of such laws assumes this opposition there is no possibility here of its even appearing to take place end of chapter five a alpha two Part 1, recording by Morris and Arzy Bedfordshire. Chapter number 5, A, Alpha 2, Part 2, of The Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 1, by George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5a, Alpha 2, Part 2, Observation of Organic Nature. The lawmaking just considered implies that the differences of the organism, taken in the sense of moments of its notion, and strictly speaking, should be an a priori process. But it essentially involves this idea that those differences have the significance of being present as something given, and the attitude of mere observation has properly to confine itself merely to their actual existence. Organic reality necessarily has within it such opposition as its notion expresses, and which can be determined as irritability and sensibility, as these again both appear distinct from reproduction. The aspect in which these moments of the notion of the organism are here considered, their externality, is the proper and peculiar immediate and externality of the inner, not the outer, which is the outer in embodied form of the whole organism the inner is to be considered in relation to this later on if however the opposition of the moment is apprehended as it is found in actual existence then sensibility irritability reproduction sink to the level of common properties which are universals just as indifferent towards one another as specific weight colour hardness etc in this sense it may be doubtless observed that one organic being is much more sensitive or more irritable or has a greater reproductive capacity than another just as we may observe that the sensibility etc of one is in kind different from that of another that one responds differently from another to a given stimulus e g a horse behaves differently towards oats from what it does towards hay and a dog again differently towards both and so on these differences can readily be observed as that one body is harder than another and so on but these sense properties hardness colour etc 
as also the phenomena responding to the stimulus of oats of irritability under certain kinds of load or of breeding a number of special kinds of young all such properties and phenomena when related to one another and compared inter se essentially defy the attempt to reduce them to law for the characteristic of their being sensuous facts consists just in their existing in the complete indifference to one another and in manifesting the freedom of nature emancipated from the control of the notion rather than the unity of a relation in exhibiting nature's irrational way of availing itself of these accidental element of quantity in order to flit hither and thither between the moments of the notion rather than in the setting forth of these moments themselves it is the other aspect in which the simple moments of the notion of organism are compared with the moments of the definite existent embodiment that would last furnish the law proper for expressing the true outer as the copy of the inner now because those simple moments are properties that permeate and pervade the whole body they do not yet work themselves out of the organic being into such a real separate existence as to form what we call an individual system constituting a definite shape gestalt or again if the abstract idea of the organism is truly expressed in those three moments merely because they are nothing stable but transitory moments of the notion and its process the organism on the other hand qua a definite embodiment is not exhaustively expressed in those three determinate systems in the way anatomy analyzes and describes them so far as such systems are to be found in their actual reality and rendered legitimate by being so found we must also bear in mind that anatomy not only puts before us three systems of that sort but a good many others as well thus then apart from this the sensitive system as a whole must mean something quite different from what is called a nervous system the irritable system something different from the muscular system the reproduction from the intestinal mechanism of reproduction in the systems constituting an embodied form gestalt in the organism is apprehended from the abstract side of lifeless physical existence so taken its moments are elements of a corpse and fall to be dealt with by anatomy they do not appertain to knowledge dealing with a living organism qua parts of that nature they have really ceased to be for they cease to process since the being of an organism consists essentially in its universality or reflection into self the being of its totality like its moments cannot consist in an anatomical system the actual expression of the whole and the externalization of its moments are really found only as a process and movement running through the various parts of the embodied organism and in this process what is extracted as an individual system and fixated so appears essentially as a fleeting moment so that the reality which anatomy finds cannot be taken for its real being but only that reality is a process a process which alone even the anatomical parts have a significance we see then that moments of the inner being of the organism taken separately by themselves are not capable of furnishing aspects of a law of organic being since in a law of that sort they refer to an objective existence are distinguished from one another and thus each aspect would not be able to be equally named in a place the other further we see that when placed on one side they do not find the other aspect of their realization in a fixed system for this fixed system is as little something that could convey truly the general nature of the organic existence as the expression of those moments of the inner life of the organism the essential nature of what is organic since this is inherently something universal lies rather in having its moments universal in concrete reality as well i e in having them as permeating processes and not in giving a copy of the universal as an isolated thing in this manner the idea of a law in the case of organic existence slips altogether from our grasp the law wants to take and express the opposition in the form of static inactive aspects to bring out in the case of those aspects the characteristic in determining their relation to one another the inner into which falls the universality appearing in the process and the outer to which belong the parts of the static form of the organism were to constitute the corresponding sides of the law but they lose in being kept asunder in this way their organic significance and at the bottom of the idea of law lies just this that its two aspects should have a subsistence each on its own account indifferent to the other and the relation of the two sides should be shared between them and have a correspondingly twofold determinate nature but really each aspect of the organism consists inherently in being simple universality wherein all determinations are dissolved and in being the process of dissolving them if we quite see the difference between this way of framing laws and previous forms it will clear up its nature completely 
Turning back to the process of perceiving, and that of understanding, intelligence, which reflects itself into itself and by doing so determines its object, we see that understanding does not therefore have before itself in its object the relation of these abstract determinations, universal and individual, essential and external. On the contrary, it is itself the actual transition, the relational process, and to itself this transition does not become objective. Here, on the other hand, the organic unity, i.e. just the relation of these opposites, is itself the object, and this relation is a pure process of transition. This process in its simplest form is directly universality, and since its universality passes into different factors whose relation is the purpose of the law to express, its moments take the form of being universal objects of this moment of consciousness, and the law runs, quote, the outer is an expression of the inner, unquote. Understanding has here grasped the thought of the law itself, whereas formerly it merely looked for laws in a general way, and their moments appeared before it in the shape of a definite and specific content, not in the form of thoughts of laws. As regards content, no law should, then, be admitted in this connection, which merely accept and passively adopt distinctions barely existent, and put them into the form of universality. But only such laws as directly maintain in these distinctions the restless activity of the notion as well, and consequently possess at the same time necessity in the relation of the two sides. Yet because that very object, organic unity, directly combines the function of endlessly superseding or the absolute negation of existence with inactive quiescent existence, and because the nature of the moments is essentially a condition of pure transition, there are thus not to be found any such mere existent aspects that are required for the law. To get such aspects, intelligence must take its stand on the other moment of the organic relation, viz. on the fact that organic existence is reflected into itself. But this mode of being is so completely reflected into itself that it has no specific character, no determinateness of its own, as against something else left over. The immediate sensuous being is so directly one with the determinate quality as such, and hence expresses therein a qualitative distinction, e.g. blue as against red, acid as against alkaloid, etc. But the organic being that has returned into itself is completely indifferent towards another. Its existence is simple universality and refuses to offer observation any permanent sense distinctions, or, what is the same thing, shows its essential characteristic to be merely the changing flux of whatever determinate qualities there are. Hence the way distinction, qua actually existing, expresses itself is just this, that it is an indifferent distinction, i.e. a distinction in the form of quantity. In this, however, the notion is extinguished and necessarily disappears. The content, however, the filling of the indifferent existence, the flux and the interchange of sense determinations when gathered into the simplicity of an organic determination, expresses at the same time the fact that the content does not have the determinate character of the immediate property, and the qualitative feature falls solely within the aspect of quantity, as we saw above. Although the objective element apprehended in the form of a determinate character of an organic existence has thus the notion inherent in it, and thereby is distinguished from the object offered to understanding, which in apprehending the content of laws proceeds in a purely perceptive manner, yet apprehension in the former case falls back entirely into the principle and manner of mere percipient understanding, for the reason that the object apprehended is used to constitute moments of a law. For by this means what is apprehended receives and keeps the character of a fixed determinate quality, the form of an immediate property or a passive phenomenon, it is further subsumed under the aspect of quantity, and the nature of the notion is suppressed. The exchange of a merely perceived object for one reflected into itself, of a mere sense character for an organic, thus loses once more its value, and does so by the fact that understanding has not yet cancelled the process of framing laws. If we compare what we find as regards this exchange in the case of a few examples, we see it may be something that the perception takes for an animal with strong muscles characterised as an animal organism of high irritability, or what perception takes to be a condition of great weakness characterised as a condition of high sensibility, or if we prefer it as an animal of abnormal affection, and moreover raising of it to a higher power, expressions which translate sensuous facts into Teutonized Latin 
instead into terms of the notion that an animal has strong muscles may be also expressed by understanding in the form that the animal possesses great muscular force great weakness similarly a slight force characterization in terms of irritability has this advantage over determinations by reference to force that the latter expresses indeterminate the former determinate reflection into self for the peculiar force characteristic of muscles is just irritability and irritability is also a preferable determination to strong muscles in that as the case of force reflection into itself is at once implied in it in the same way weakness or slight force organic passivity is expressed in a determinate manner by sensibility but when this sensibility is so taken by itself and fixed and the element of quantity is still bound up with it and qua greater or less sensibility is opposed to a greater or less irritability each is reduced entirely to the level of sense and put into the ordinary form of sense property their principal relation is not the notion but on the contrary is the aspect of quantity into which the opposition is now cast thus becoming a distinction not constituted by thought while in this way the indeterminate nature of the expressions force strength weakness would indeed be got rid of there now arises the equally futile and indeterminate process of dealing with the opposites of a higher and low degree of sensibility and irritability as they increase and decrease relatively to one another the greater or less sensibility or irritability is no less a sensuous phenomenon grasped and expressed without any reference to thought than strength and weakness are sense determinations not constituted by thought the notion has not taken the place of those non-conceptual expressions instead strength and weakness have been given a filling by a character which taken by itself alone rests on the notion and has the notion as its content but loses entirely this origin and character owing to the form of simplicity and immediacy then in which this content is made an element of law and through the element of quantity which constitutes the principle of distinction for such determinations the reality which originally is a notion and is put forward as such retains the character of sense perception and remains as far as removed from knowledge as when characterized in terms of strength or weakness of force or through immediate sense properties there is still left to consider what the outer side of the organic being is when taken by itself alone and how in its case the opposition of its inner and outer is determined just as at first considered the inner of the whole in relation to its own proper outer the outer looked at by itself is the embodied form and shape gestaltung in general the system of life articulated in the element of existence and at the same time essentially the existence of the organism as it is for another objective reality in its aspect of self-existence this other appears in the first instance as its outer inorganic nature if these two are looked at in relation to a law the inorganic nature cannot as we saw before constitute the aspect of a law beside the organic being because the latter exists absolutely for itself and assumes a universal and free relation to its inorganic nature to define more exactly however the relation of these two aspects in the case of the organic form this form in which the organism is embodied is in one aspect turned against its inorganic nature while in another it is for itself and reflected into itself the real organic being is the mediating agency which brings together and unites this self-existence of life its being for itself with the outer in general what is simply and inherently is the one extreme self-existence is however the inner in the sense of an infinite one which takes the moments of the embodied shape out of their subsistence and connection with outer nature and withdraws these moments back into itself it is that which having no content looks to the embodied form of the organism to provide its content and appears there as the process in that form in this extreme where it is more negativity or pure individual existence the organism finds its absolute freedom whereby it is made quite secure and indifferent towards the fact of its being relative to another and towards the specific character belonging to the moment of the form of the organism this free detachment is at the same time a freedom of the moments themselves it is the possibility of their appearing in existence of being apprehended and just as they are detached and indifferent in regard to what is outer so too they are towards one another for their simple nature of the freedom consists in mere being or in their bare substance 
this notion of pure freedom is one and the same time life no matter how varied and diverse the ways in which the shape assumed by the organism its being for another may disport itself it is a matter of indifference to this stream of life what sort of mills it drives in the first place we must now note that this notion is not to be taken here as it was formerly when we were considering the inner proper in its character as a process or development of the moments we must take it in its form as bare and simple inner which constitutes the purely universal aspect as against the concrete living reality it is the element in which the existing members of the organic shape find their subsistence for it is this shape we are considering here and in it the essential nature of life appears as the simple fact of subsistence that being so the existence for another the specific character of the real embodied form is taken up into this simple universality in which its nature lies specificity that is likewise of a simple universal non-sensuous kind and can only be that which finds expression in number number is the middle term of that organic form which links indeterminate life with actual concrete life simple like the former and determinate like the latter that which in the case of the former the inner would have the sense of number would require to express the outer after its manner as a multiform reality kinds of life colour and so on in general as the whole host of differences which are developed as a phenomenon of life if these two aspects of the organic whole the one being the inner and the other the outer in such a way that each again has its inner and an outer are compared with reference to the inner both sides have we find that the inner of the first is the notion in the sense of the restless activity of abstraction the second has for its inner however inactive universality which involves also the constant characteristic number hence if because the notion develops its moments in the former this aspect is made into a delusive promise of laws owing to the semblance of necessity in the relation the latter directly disclaims doing so since number shows itself to be the determining feature of one aspect of the laws for its number is just that entirely inactive inert and indifferent characteristic in which every moment and relational process is extinguished and which is broken the bridge leading to the living expression of impulses manner of life and whatever other sensuous existence there is this way of considering the embodied organic shape as such and the inner qua inner merely of that embodied form is however in point of fact no longer a consideration of organic existence for both these aspects which were to be related are merely taken different to one another and thereby reflection under the self the essential nature of organism is done away with what we have done here is rather to transfer that attempted comparison of inner and outer to the sphere of inorganic nature the notion with its infinity he is here merely the inner essence which lies hidden away within or falls outside in self-consciousness and no longer as in the case of the organism possesses its objectivity in the actual present this relation of inner and outer has thus still to be considered in its own proper sphere in the first place that inner element of the form and shape assumed being the simple individual existence of an inorganic thing is the specific gravity as a simple existing fact this can be observed just as much as the characteristic of number which is the only one suiting to it or properly speaking it can be found by comparing observations and it seems in this way to furnish one aspect of the law the embodied form colour hardness toughness and an innumerable host of other properties which would together constitute the outer aspect and would have to give expression to the characteristic of the inner number so that the one should find its counterpart in the other now because negativity is here taken not in the sense of a movement of the process but as an inoperative unity or as a self-existence pure and simple it appears really as that by which the thing resists the process and maintains itself within itself and in a condition of indifference towards it by the fact however that this simple self-existence this bare being for itself is an inactive indifference towards another specific gravity appears as one property alongside others and therewith all necessary relation on its part to this plurality or in other words all conformity to law ceases the specific gravity in the sense of the simple inner aspect does not contain difference in itself 
or the difference it has is merely non-essential, for its bare simplicity just cancels every distinction of an essential kind. This non-essential difference or quantity was thus bound to find its other or counterpart in the other aspect, the plurality of properties, since it is only by doing so that it is difference at all. When this plurality itself is held together within the simple form of opposition and is determined, say, as cohesion, so that its cohesion is self-existence in otherness, as specific gravity is pure self-existence, then the cohesion here is primarily this pure conceptually constituted character as against the previous characteristic. The mode of framing the law would thus be what is discussed above in dealing with the relation of sensibility to irritability. Furthermore, cohesion qua conception of self-existence in otherness is merely the abstraction of the aspect opposed to specific gravity, and as such has no essential reality. For self-existence is in the other the process wherein the inorganic would have to express its self-existence as a form of self-conservation, which again would prevent it emerging from the process as a constituent moment of a product. Yet this goes directly against its nature, which has no purpose or universality in it. Rather, its process is simply the specific way of bringing out how its self-existence, in the sense of its specific gravity, cancels itself. This determinate mode of procedure, which in that case would constitute the true principle implied in its cohesion, is itself, however, entirely indifferent to the other notion, that of the determinate quality of its specific gravity. If the mode of procedure were left entirely out of account and attention confined to the idea of quantity, we might be able to think of a feature like this, the greater specific weight, as it is a higher intensiveness of being, would resist entering into the process more than a less specific weight. But conversely, freedom of self-existence shows itself only in the facility to meddle with and enter into everything and maintain itself throughout this manifold variety. That intensity without extension of relations is an abstraction with no substance to it, for extension constitutes the existence of intensity. The self-conservation of the inorganic element in its relation lies, however, as already mentioned, outside its nature, since it does not contain the principle of movement within it, or because its being is not absolute negativity and not a notion. When this other aspect of the inorganic, on the other hand, is considered not as a process, but as an inoperative being, it is ordinary cohesion. It is a simple sense property standing on one side over against the liberated moment of otherness, which lies scattered over a plurality of properties indifferent to and apart from one another, and appears amongst these as specific gravity or weight. The multiplicity of properties together then constitutes the other side to the latter specific gravity. In its case, however, as in the case of the multiplicity, number is the only characteristic feature which not merely does not bring out a relation and a transition from one to another of these properties, but consists essentially in having no necessary relation. Its nature is rather to make manifest the absence of all conformity to law, for it expresses the determinate character as one that is non-essential. Thus we see that a series of bodies whose distinction is expressed as a numerical difference of their specific weights by no means runs parallel to a series where the difference is constituted by other properties, even if, for purposes of simplification, we select merely one or two of them. For as a matter of fact, it could only be the tout ensemble of the properties which would have to constitute the other parallel aspect here. In order to make this into a connected single compact whole, observation finds before it the quantitative determinations of these various properties, but on the other hand, their differences come to light as qualitative. In this compound, then, what would have to be characterized as positive or negative would be cancelled each by the other. In general, and the internal arrangement and exposition of the equation, which would be very composite, would belong to the notion. The notion, however, is excluded from operating just by the way in which the properties are found lying. They are to be picked up as mere existent entities. In the condition of mere being, none is negative in its relation to another. The one exists just as much as the other, and in no other fashion does it indicate its presence in the arrangement of the whole. In the case of a series with concurrent differences, whether the relation is meant to be that of simultaneous increase on both sides, 
or of increase on the one and decrease on the other, interest centres mainly in the last simple expression of this combined whole, which would constitute the one aspect of the law with specific gravity for the opposite. But this one aspect qua resultant fact is nothing else than what has been already mentioned, viz. an individual property, say like ordinary cohesion, alongside and indifferent to which the others, specific gravity among them, are found, lying in every other, can be selected equally rightly, i.e. equally wrongly, to stand as representative of the entire other aspect. One as well as the other would merely represent, or stand for, vorstellen, the essential reality, wesen, but it would not actually be the fact, Sasha, itself. Thus it seems that the attempt to find a series of bodies which should in their two aspects run continuously and simply parallel and express the essential nature of the bodies in a law holding these two aspects must be looked at as a name that is ignorant alike of what it is about and the means for carrying it through. At a previous stage, the relation between the inner and outer phase of the organic form set before observation was forthwith transferred to the sphere of the inorganic. The determinate condition to which this can be due now can be stated more precisely, and there arises thence a further form and relation in this connection. What seems to present the possibility of such comparison of inner and outer in the case of the organic drops away altogether when we come to the organic. The inorganic inner is an inner bare and simple, which comes before perception as a merely existent property. Its characteristic determination is therefore essentially quantity qua existent property. It appears indifferent towards the outer or the plurality of the other sense properties. The self-existence of the living organism, however, does not stand on one side opposed to its outer. It has the principle of otherness within itself. If we characterize self-existence as a simple self-preserving relation to itself, its otherness, its negativity bare and simple, and organic unity is the unity of self-identical self-relation and pure negativity. This unity is, qua unity, the inner phase of the organic. The organic is thereby inherently universal. It is a genus. The freedom of the genus with reference to its realization is, however, something different from the freedom of the specific gravity with reference to its embodied form. That of the latter is freedom in the sphere of existence. It is in the sense that it takes a stand on one side as a particular property. Because it is an existent freedom, it is also only a determinate character essentially belonging to this one embodied form, or through which this one form, qua reality, is a determinate entity. The freedom, however, of the genus is a universal freedom and indifferent to this embodied form or towards its realization. The characteristic feature attaching to the self-existence as such of the inorganic is therefore subordinated in the case of the organic to the self-existence, while the case of the inorganic is subordinated to its mere existence. Hence, although in the case of the latter that determinate characteristic appears at the same time only as a property, yet it possesses the value of being essential because qua bare negative it stands over against concrete existence which is being for another and the simple negative in its final form, as a particular characteristic, is a number. The organic, however, is an individual entity which itself pure negativity, and hence eradicates within it the fixed determinateness of number which suits the indifference of mere being. So far as it has in its moment of indifferent being, and thereby of number, this numerical element can only therefore be regarded as a side issue within it, but not as the essential nature of its living activity. But now, through pure negativity, the principle of the process does not fall outside organic existence, and though the organic does not possess negativity as an adjectival characteristic attached to its inner nature, the singleness of the individual organism being instead inherently universal, yet this pure singleness is not therein developed and realized in its various moments, as if these were themselves abstract or universal. On the contrary, this developed expression makes its appearance outside that universality, which thus falls back into a mere immanence and inwardness, and between the concrete realization of the embodied form, i.e. the self-developing individual singleness of the organism, and the organic universal, the genus, appears, the determinate or specific universal, the species. This existential form, 
to which the negativity of the universal and the negativity of the genus attains is merely the explicitly developed movement of a process carried out among the parts of the given shape assumed by the organism if the genus had the different parts within itself as an unbroken simple unity so that its simple negativity as such were just at the same time a movement carried through the parts equally simple and directly universal in themselves which were here actual as such moments then the organic genus would be consciousness but the simple determinate character qua determinateness of the species is present in an unconscious manner in the genus concrete realization starts from the genus and what finds express realization is not the genus as such i e not really thought this genus qua actual organic fact is represented by a deputy number which is the representative here seems to designate the transition from the genus to the individual embodiment and to set before observation the two aspects of conceptual necessity one in the form of a simple characteristic the other in the form of an organic shape with all its manifold variety fully developed this representative however really denotes the indifference and freedom of the universal and the individual as regards one another the genus puts the individual at the mercy of mere quantitative difference a non-essential element but the individual qua living shows itself equally independent of this difference true universality in this way specified here is merely inner nature qua characteristic determination of the species it is formal universality and in opposition to the latter that true universality takes its stand on the side of organic individual singleness which is a living individual entity by means of that universality and owing to its inner nature is not troubled by its determinate character as a species but this singleness is not at the same time a universal individual i e one in which universality would have external realization as well this falls outside the living organic whole this universal individual however in the way it is immediately the individual of the natural embodiments of organic life is not consciousness itself its existence qua single organic living individual cannot fall outside that universal if it is to be consciousness we have then here a connected system where one extreme is the universal life qua universal or genus the other being that same life qua a single whole or universal individual the mediating term however is a combination of both the first seeming to fit itself into it as a determinate universality or as a species the other as a single whole proper or individual singleness and since this connected system belongs altogether to the aspect of the organic embodiment it comprehends within it too what is distinguished as inorganic nature since now the universal life qua the simple essence of the genus develops from its side the distinctions of the notion and has to exhibit them in the form of a series of simple determining characteristics the series is a system of distinctions set up indifferently or in a numerical series whereas formerly the organic in the form of something individual and single was placed in opposition to this non-essential distinction of quantity a distinction which neither expresses nor contains the living nature and while precisely the same has to be stated as regards the inorganic taking into account its entire existence developed in the plurality of its properties it is now the universal individual which is not merely to be looked on as free from every articulation of the genus but also as the power and might inherent in the genus the genus disperses into species after the manner of the universality characteristic of number or again it may adopt as its principle of division particular characteristics of its existence like figure colour etc while prosecuting the same the genus meets with violence at the hands of the universal individual the earth which in the role of the universal negativity establishes the distinctions as they exist within itself the nature of which owing to the substance they belong to is different from the nature of that genus and makes good these distinctions as against the process of generic systematization this action on the part of the genus comes to be quite a restricted business which can only carry on inside these mighty elements which are left with gaps and arrested and interrupted at all points through their unbridled violence it follows from all this that the embodied organic existent observation can only meet with reason in the sense of life in general which however in its differentiating process involves really no rational sequence and articulation and is not 
a thoroughly grounded system of shapes and forms if the process of connecting these moments which organic embodiment involves the mediating term which connects the species and the realization in the form of single individuality had within it the two extremes of inner universality and universal individuality then this middle term would have the movements of its reality and the expression and nature of its universality and would be self-systematizing development it is thus that consciousness takes the middle term between universal spirit and its individuation or sense consciousness the system of shapes assumed by consciousness as an orderly self-constituted whole of the life of the spirit the system of forms of conscious life which is dealt with in this treatise and which finds its objective and existential expression as the history of the world but organic nature has no history it drops from its universal life immediately into the individuation of existence and the moments of simple determinateness and individual living activity which are united in this realization bring about the process of change merely as a contingent movement wherein each plays its own part and the whole is preserved but the energy thus exerted is restricted so far as itself is concerned merely to its own focus because the whole is not present in it and the whole is not there because the whole is not as such here for itself besides the fact then that reason in observing organic nature only comes to see itself as universal life in general it comes to see the development and realization of this life merely by way of systems distinguished quite generally in the determination of which the essential reality lies not in the organic fact as such but in the universal individual the earth and among these distinctions of earth it comes to see that development and realization in the form of sequences which the genus attempts to establish since then in its realization the universality found in organic life lets itself drop directly into the extreme of individuation without any true self-referring process of mediation the thing before the observing mind is merely a would-be meaning and if reason can be at the trouble to observe what is thus meant here it is confined to describing and recording nature's meanings and incidental suggestions this irrational freedom of fancying and thinking doubtless will produce on all sides beginnings of laws traces of necessity hints and allusions to order and sequence ingenious and specious relations of all kinds but in relating the organic to the different facts of the inorganic elements zones climates so far as regards law and necessary connection observation can never get further than the idea of a great influence so too on the other side where individuality has not the significance of the earth but of the oneness imminent in organic life this is immediate unity within the universal no doubt constitutes the genus but is simple unity just for that reason determined merely as a number and hence let go the qualitative appearance here observation cannot get further than making clever remarks bringing out interesting points of connection making friendly advances to the notion but clever remarks do not amount to a knowledge of necessity interesting points of connection stop short at being simply of interest while the interest is still nothing but arbitrary opinion about the rational and the friendliness of the individual in making allusion to a notion is a childlike friendliness which is childish if it stands to be or wants to be worth anything end of chapter five alpha two part two recording by morris in arlsey bedfordshire